All right, welcome everyone uh, to our deep dive about form and Ansible modules and how to contribute to them. So uh, this time Evgeny will uh, demystify all these things. Um, and we have uh, some people from the community here as well as uh, some support engineers from Red Hat. Uh, so we'll definitely uh, publish this recording on the Foreman YouTube channel so everyone can benefit from it. So uh, without further ado, um, I'll hand over the microphone to Evgeny and it's all yours. Thanks, Marek. Good morning. Um, we are here for Foreman Ansible modules, deep dive. And first of all, like, hi, I'm Evgeny, uh, who has not yet worked with me or talked to me. Um, I'm currently working as a software engineer at Red Hat. And in my previous life, I was a consultant, both at Red Hat and not. And there was like the theme of automating everything because uh, nobody likes doing things manually. And I'm trying to improve this also in, in satellite. Part of this, um, like how, do, how, how to improve automation, how to make automation. The, the, the easiest way is to, to use Ansible, right? And um, given that Foreman has an API and we have Ansible, there is, of course, a way to uh, meld those two together. And instead of clicking in the UI, just write YAML and make Ansible do all the nice things in the background for us. So we can focus on defining a state and Ansible takes care of ensuring it is like it is. Um, but of course, like with, with any software, um, there are bugs, there are missing features. And today we are here to talk about more about how you all can contribute and also what we can do to improve um, the overall integration of Ansible and Foreman. But we first of all, let's briefly look at what Foreman Ansible modules are today, what they can do, what they cannot do. So um, what we do is we ship a collection of modules to interact with the Foreman API. We also ship roles in the same collection to make things easier, but the main focus of the collection are the modules today. And even so, I will say Foreman a lot of times today. This, of course, also includes Catello. It includes remote execution discovery. It includes Orcarino if you're running um, Orcarino. It includes Satellite if you run Satellite. Whatever uses Foreman as the API entry point, this will work with them. Um, but sometimes you need a couple more lines of code to uh, make a specific feature to work. Um, you can't start talking about uh, Ansible without having YAML on slide two, right? Um, so this is like a super simple example how you would use one of our modules. And the organization module is quite simple. It can create an organization and set a few parameters of it. Um, but the main point here is you invoke an um, a module in Ansible, and you pass a few parameters. Um, you have the common ones like username, password, server, URL um, that are present like in every module because they define how you talk to the API, like at which URL, which, which credentials, you cannot work with API without them. And then you have the more specific to that module once, like in this case, we want to create an ACME organization. So we pass ACME to, uh, to the module and it will, in the background, ensure that the state is present when you run this playbook. Same thing would happen if you say state absent, then it would ensure that this, um, this organization does not exist. Pretty easy, but um, I also hope that Everybody here has seen this so far because today we want to go more under the hood and see what happens actually when we execute this and what 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 needs to happen to um, to adjust behavior and stuff. Um, so well, what happens under the hood? We've seen that we provide credentials. So uh, the modules will go and connect to the API. It's an HTTP connection. And in most cases, um, we define entities, right? An organization, a domain, 
a subnet for formant things, but also something like a product or repository for Catello. But they all have, have, have in common that they are like an object that is stored in the database somewhere. And we can refer to it usually by the name. And when we say, uh, we call the module and say name equals ECMI in the example before, the module will go um, invoke a, a search uh, query to the API. And if it finds the entity and we said it needs to be present, it checks that all parameters are identical and does nothing in the best case, right? If it doesn't exist, it will go and create it. And if it needs updating or deleting, it will just do what, what the user asked it to do. And obviously, after um, an execution has happened, it will report a state back to the user. Like, I changed uh, the name from uh, Acme to Foo. Or I deleted the organization because you asked me to delete it. So you can later on in your playbooks act based on these results. However, as, as mentioned before, software isn't perfect. So we have um, lots of issues. Most of them are small, but we have them. Um, and the first and most glaring one, I guess, is um, our docs and examples aren't the best. If you ever used uh, Hammer, then um, you know that Hammer will go and pull down the API doc from from the set uh, from Foreman and also show the help uh, based on that. Ansible cannot do this because it needs the documentation to be static. Um, so we need to have essentially a copy of the documentation strings in our Ansible playbooks, uh, Ansible modules, so I'm sorry. Um, and because like documentation is updated in Foreman, and sometimes things got, get forgotten to be updated in, in our Ansible modules. Same thing happens with parameters. The API gets a new parameter. And um, I think Hammer almost um, transparently handles this if there's like no special handling for this parameter. Um, but again, Ansible, due to the fact how it works, needs to know about the for parameter beforehand. And we need to add. It's like two lines, but they need to be added, and that gets forgotten quite often. And of course, the more um, complicated cases, we are actually missing whole modules because a feature was added that has a completely new API endpoint, but nobody added a module. Um, I think most teams try to at least inform us or try to add a module themselves. But nevertheless, um, we have, a, I would say, a sizable gap there, um, and we should close it. So, and I guess you're here today for actually doing this, closing this gap. So um, what can you do? Of course, you already have everything prepared, and you just go and open a PR against form and Ansible modules. I'll approve it, and we have something fixed tomorrow. Perfect. Um, it's probably not the case, but um, this would be like the ideal one. Um, one one ask, please, uh, especially for those of you working with satellite, we do ship a satellite branded version of this collection in satellite and also on Automation Hub. Please do not open uh, PRs against the branded version. They will be overwritten because we sync automatically from the upstream re repository. And thanks to GitHub, you cannot turn off the pull request feature. Sorry, but that's that's life. Um, but also, um, every time you open a BZ or a GitHub issue, or tell us in any other way, hey, um, there is a missing feature, and I tried to implement this workflow and it, I couldn't. This is still a very valuable help because um, adding the one line quite often is. Like it's an easy task, but you need to know that you need to do it. So uh, issues help very much. Um, however, I will not teach you how to open issues. Um, I hope most of you know this. And uh, if not, this is a whole other discussion. Today, 
we wanted to focus on the code. So um, the repository, how to, sub, uh, how to submit useful PRs against it. And uh, I called it from typo to new module because this is like the scale that you can go. Like first uh, thing is you, you fix a typo, which is still very valuable. And at the other end is a new module, which also will improve the workflow of somebody. So um, when you go and clone the repository or open it up in the GitHub UI, whatever, however you want to work with it, you will be greeted with a sheer amount of folders and files. And uh, let's look at the very important ones. Um, this is already like a cleaned up view. There's like a make file there that I didn't list and quite a few another like auxiliary files that are not that important um, because you usually will not touch them. But um, those are the ones that um, end up being touched a lot. And well, let's just go over from, from top to down. Uh, down sorry. Uh, it starts with change logs because um, change logs are very important. Whenever we do a release, we use the Ansible change log tool, which gathers snippets from the change log repository and creates a change log based, like a change log file that we can publish on, on GitHub. We publish it to, to the Galaxy. And people can go and look like know what changed, right? Um, there's like a simple example of such a YAML file. And it's usually just um, essentially a dictionary saying uh, which kind of change is in this PR. In this case, it was the bug fix. And then you just go um, and say like bullet points, repository module, and then some explanation what, what you changed and ideally a reference to a BZ or a GitHub issue. Um, it's not mandatory in terms of we will not accept a PR without it. And honestly, we quite often do because it's easier for us to add a change log entry manually afterwards quite often. But at the same time, when the reporter adds the change log already, it might be in their own best words because like they're fixing a problem they had and they probably can best express what the change is about. Um, the next folder on that list is docs. And confusingly to everybody, it doesn't contain any documentation at all. What it does contain is um, configuration and templates for Sphinx, which is like the um, most common Python uh, documentation engine, I think. And um, those are used then together with a tool called Ansible Docs to build the documentations, documentation, which is then extracted from the modules themselves. I'll talk about that in a moment. For today's exercise, we're just going to uh, ignore this folder. It's usually not to be touched because there is nothing of interest in there. Um, then we have a meta folder, which um, contains, as the name tries to suggest, metadata in two files. One of them is runtime.yaml, and it contains essentially three things. Uh, the minimal supported Ansible version, which we still list as 2.9 point something, which was like the very first one properly supporting collections. And we also ensure in CI that this version is like the one we still work with. I think Ansible itself today says it do not support anything older than 2.4. 14, and they've been pressing us to bump this. I've been reluctant to com comply, but there we are. Um, then it contains module redirects because uh, with introdu introduction of collections, um, Ansible needed a way to say, if you're calling the old module name, but the module moved to a collection, uh, we need to have a mapping. Um, it's there. so. Um, it tries things like um, if you use the old names from the from this repository from before it got the collections so of foreman underscore organization instead of the foreman foreman organization, 
um, it would try to um, perform this redirect internally in Ansible. And um, then it contains action groups, which is, I think, the most interesting feature of Ansible uh, metadata these days. You can create groups of modules and define parameters that apply to those groups. So for example, we've seen that we need to pass um, server URL and username and password. And we can just say in our playbook that this, those three parameters apply to all invocations of uh, form and Ansible modules and don't do not have to repeat ourselves again. It's pretty nice. And then uh, there is the execution environment YAML. Uh, this is used by Ansible Builder to build containers, which then can be used on automation platform or AWX to execute our collection in a defined environment. Um, again, this is nothing that's really interesting for today. Um, those action groups that I mentioned earlier need to be updated when we add a new module. But uh, luckily for everybody, we have an entry in our make file that just does this for us. So you don't have to do it manually at all. As, as you see, uh, we love automation. Next folder is a bit um, convoluted, I'd say, because it's called plugins, but there's actually everything in there. Like this is the meat of the collection, you could say. Um, it has like the actual plugins and we have different types of plugins for you. We have callback, we have one callback, so, uh, to be honest. We have one filter, we have one inventory and I think something like 80-ish um, uh, traditional modules. The callback is responsible for feeding back uh, information back to Foreman. So for example, if you, from Foreman, use uh, the Foreman Ansible integration to run a task on your client, uh, the callback will be used to report as uh, the state of this task back, back to Foreman. Uh, filter is something that um, it's rarely used. It's one filter to properly generate candle pin labels. Um, it was written at some point because we needed it, but I don't actually think anybody like in the community really needs it, but yeah. Uh, inventory is heavily used if you want to pull down the machines you have in Foreman and run Ansible jobs against it. And modules are the ones that are actually interacting with the Foreman API to manage Foreman. And this folder also contains all the documentation, which is a bit confusing, I guess, because it's not called docs. Uh, but the way Ansible works is all the documentation that you both see online on the pages, and also if you call ansible doc dash, um, dash l for listing, and then um, with, a, uh, organ, uh, with a module name to, to, to see the documentation, it is loaded from the plugin files itself. So the plugin files contain a rather big static um, block, which you need to uh, modify if you um, if you want to have documentation updated. It also has a folder, like a subfolder, doc fragments, because um, Ansible realized at some point that you have sometimes groups of modules and you want to document the same thing for multiple modules at the same time. Um, again, the same example with the credentials, um, the server uh, username and password, uh, parameters are documented as a doc fragment and not in each file because it would make sense to have them um, duplicated everywhere. And then we have some shared code in module utils. And you will say, what shared code? Uh, why do you need this? Um, but uh, this is um, the whole thing that performs the connection to the API, um, parsing of the API description, which is a huge JSON file, and handling all the common parameters. And I guess I'll be using this username password server URL example like all the day here today, because it's like so common. Um, but it also um, has the common um, handling for um, database objects, right? Or API resources. 
Um, in most cases, it doesn't matter whether I want to create an organization or a location or a domain or anything. Um, the, um, uh, the way it works is, is always the same. It's, it's fetch the existing one, if any. Um, if it doesn't exist, um, create it. If it does exist, compare to what the user said, update it, delete it. Um, so given, given this flow is in, I think, like 80% of the modules the same, um, we have that extracted to, um, to a common uh, library, and that can be used for all the modules. Um, if you ever go and open the Foreman helper file that is in there, you will notice that there are like a lot of classes in it, and we use subclassing quite heavily uh, because even though we are talking like to the same API all the time, the API endpoints, I would say you can group them in different types. Like for example, um, when you're talking to Foreman core APIs, uh, things can belong to multiple organizations. And at the same time, providing an organization is optional because things can be organization-less informant. The moment you're talking to Catello-specific APIs, for example, products or something, uh, passing the organization parameter becomes uh, um, mandatory and uh, objects only can belong to one organization. So there is a Foreman Ansible module uh, class and the Catello Ansible module class, which um, do the same base thing, right? But uh, have slightly different defaults um, and parameters to, to, to live with that. Um, so much for the shared chord. Then I mentioned VF roles. Um, they're mostly thin wrappers that are designed to allow you to do bulk actions. Um, at some point, we realized that people don't want to create one product. They want to create 20 products, right? And for them, it's easier to have a variable uh, called like Foreman products, listing all those 20 products, and call a, a role. Then then we'll do the, the looping itself internally versus um, writing a playbook that has a loop themselves. Um, it's nothing really Foreman special. Uh, like there's no Foreman specific code, just the fact that it's using uh, the Foreman modules to, to then talk to the API. Um, right. Next up on the list, uh, we have the tests folder, which is super important but also something that you probably not will not touch like on, on day one, hopefully on day two or so. Um, we have a few unit tests for, uh, for the code, for the shared code I mentioned earlier, but the most ones are integration tests for the modules. And they all, well, not all, but most of them again, um, have the same structure that they try to create things, update things, and delete things, and in, have intermediate steps to check that the thing in the database were actually created. And for example, also ensure uh, idempotency in, in Ansible. So if I execute the same create statement or this, like say I want to ensure the same object to be present, the so second invocation has no changes, right? Because there is nothing to change or same with updates or deleting. If I'm updating it to the same value, nothing should happen. And if I'm deleting the one that I've already deleted, it, it's already gone. So there is nothing to be deleted. And all of that is then recorded as fixtures uh, with uh, a tool called VCR. So video cassette recorder, right? So you do not require a running foreman to re-execute the tests. So uh, if you open a PR and CI runs tests um, on GitHub Actions, we do not spin up a Foreman installation and execute all that uh, live. We compare the, um, the API requests created from the code with the ones recorded. 
And this allows us to have CI run against all the versions of Ansible we want to support and various Python versions in like six to 10 minutes. And if you would spin up a foreman, you would probably still fit into the six to 10 minutes, but the moment you uh, need to spin up a Catello and maybe even sync some repositories, you're totally gonna break this limit. And um, from a contributor perspective, the worst thing you can get is a slow CI and slow um, like response. Did I did everything right or did I did something wrong? Um, so yeah, this was so far the last folder like from the structure perspective. And now I wanted to go over some um, mostly not invented exercises of doing things. But I guess this is a good place to have a short break and ask if everybody is like still following or has questions so far. I hear no questions, so we can continue. Cool. Um, first exercise is documentation. Um, I always think that this is like, it's a simple entry point but it improves the user experience so much that um, you should do this. Like every time somebody opens a case, maybe if you're from support and say, it's like, I don't know how to do this. In many, many cases, it will boil down to a missing example maybe. And if you can then talk them through how to do something and add this example back to the documentation, there will be no second case open about this. So everybody wins, right? Um, one example or the first example was um, slightly different. It was from Kenny. And uh, he was doing something uh, with job templates and realized that the example we had is not copy pastable, which is like the second worst thing can happen. You take an example, copy paste it to your playbook and it doesn't work. And then as like, as a user, you sit there and say, what the hell? Why is this happening to me? I just copied the example from the documentation. Why is it wrong? And in this case, it was just simple um, indentation error. And it's a bit get a bit bad to see from, from the pure diff uh, here. So I'm going to open up in GitHub. Does it work? Yes, perfect. And if we open up the file a bit, just a second. This is like the file is still it's a job template uh, module, and it has an example section, which gets rendered to um, uh, uh, Ansible doc, but also the the web pages as a block of YAML, and we try to have those example have like a, a useful name that explain what this example does. And then um, also something that uh, people can go and use in their setup. And the change here is was, uh, if you scroll down to the actual thing is, um, the example was how do we upload a directory full of job templates to Foreman? And for that Ansible has this nice with file lock option where it can go and um, loop over files in the directory, but it is a parameter that you need to pass to Ansible, not to the module itself. So it needs to be slightly differently indented. And this is like, this is all that like deleting, I think four uh, spaces was all the contribution was about, but it got users from, I have a non-working example to a working one, which I think is worse a lot. Um, closing this and going to the next slide, which is another example of a single line change. Um, but this time it's not in in a module itself. It's in the doc fragments because I mentioned earlier, some of them are like ex ex extracted to fragments. And here um, the um, the user com uh, complained that they tried to do something um, when, like, when you create a host or a host group, you can set a content source, right? 
if you have Catello. And this is then used for um, or uh, pull down the content from the system. And they try to use uh, the full blown URL in there. And it would, when you execute the module, it would go and say, I couldn't find this. And the user was, but there is a, a content source at that endpoint. And the reality is, yes, there is, but you have to pass the name, which is identical to the URL, but you don't have the HTTPS in the front of it. Super silly, but that's that's live. And if you put like the name, you would end up having a working module uh, or a working invocation. And again, um, the diff view is rather short, but if you go up, it's like super long. But you have this host options thing, which we uh, then go and use in both the host and the host group modules. This is why it's um, uh, extracted to a, to, a uh, to a fragment. And it has like all the options that you would get, like compute resource, compute profile, domain, subnet, and everything but also at the very bottom, content source. And this is where the seemingly small change was, was but still it um, made life of, of users easier. So um, for the next example, um, we are going a bit, a bit further. Uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, we have a lot of parameters that we need to have defined in Ansible. And while Hammer can load those dynamically from the API, we cannot because Ansible wants them to know beforehand, so before it executes. Otherwise, it cannot do validation. It cannot do um, um, documentation. And every now and then, developers add features, which is great. Uh, but those features uh, don't necessarily need to be reflected in Hammer, but they need to be reflected in our Ansible modules. So how can we add a new parameter for our module and what does this actually mean? Because like, here's an example of the content view module and at some point Catello got uh, the notion of an import only content view. So it's used for content imports, but it cannot be presented to clients. At least that's my understanding of it. I uh, never really dug into the whole content import export thing in Catello. Um, but we needed to go and add this to Ansible. So what actually needs to happen? We need to add this to the documentation stance that we've seen before. Right, so we need to say there is a new parameter and um, it's a bit, again, dense on, this, on the slide and I have so, the link to the full, full, full commit below here. Um, the documentation stanza has an options um, entry, which like all Ansible modules, not only a form and Ansible ones have. And you go and you define the, the name of the parameter, a description, a type, and ideally also tell which um, version of the collection did this get added. This is useful when people go and read documentation online, then they know, oh, this was added in a newer version that I have, so I either cannot use it or need to update, right? However, this does not, like this would define it in the documentation, but it would not help us for our like, actual execution. Well, for that, we need to add the same thing, more or less, in another place. Um, we need, we, we have an argument, uh, argument spec, which I will show in, in detail later. And it has like all the parameters that you enter in Ansible, but also all of them that are then passed on to 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 Foreman, and we need to add it here. So um, as you've seen earlier, it is the name is import only and the type is boolean. Um, we don't care about the description and version added. 
uh, in the spec, but the pipe and name we have to pass in here. And again, if we open the full view, um, we then see that this is like the whole module. Um, it has a name, it has a spec, which I'll talk about in a moment. And we have like all the old ones defined, then we add the new one in the middle. I don't know why I've added it here, not at the end, doesn't matter. Uh, Ansible will sort them alphabetically in documentation anyway, and here the order just, just doesn't matter. And then it just goes and does some execution of it, but for uh, for actually like um, the change that was needed, this is it. We added an a Boolean uh, parameter. Ansible knows about it, and due to the way how our modules work, also. Um, this is all you need to do um, when this gets translated to, um, to to the API calls. And with that, I'm getting to the last kind of exercise. It's a new model one, and there I'll talk about the whole spec part in more detail. So close, perfect. So. Exercise three, new modules. And I've been talking about the organization module before. And this is not the whole module because it has more parameters than this. But it's a sufficient uh, extract of it to talk through it um, and, and understand what's happening. First of all, um, let's, let's go line by line, essentially. Um, I, I said earlier that we have helpers that define base information and base functionality. And one of those abstraction classes is form an entity and uh, form an entity Ansible module. Uh, this essentially says it's an Ansible module for foreman that is uh, handling an entity. We also have um, modules that don't handle entities in terms of they don't have a state. Um, but the entity ones are the most most common and most interesting one. Um, this class brings us all the functionality we need to connect to the API, um, get the parameters that are like shared, like server URL, and etc. But also, uh, it gets us all the tooling that is needed to transform. Um, the things that the user has entered into a proper API call. And how is this uh, done? Uh, let's let's talk through this. Um, so first of all, we need to define a class that has the right name. There is a bit of, um, you can call it magic in the background, that will deduct the right um, API endpoint based on the class name. So if the module is called foreman something module, it will know that the something is the endpoint that it needs to talk to. So um, organization will get translated to organizations. Um, or for example, later on, I'll show you the Catello product module, and uh, then it knows that it needs to talk to the product endpoint. So once we have the endpoint, uh, we need to have um, the parameters that we pass um, to, to the API, right? So we need um, the credentials to know how to connect there, but we also need to know like what is the object like and what do we need to submit? Um, I trimmed this down to just have the name here. Uh, I think the API of organization also support a description and label. And if you have Catello, you have slightly more, but let's ignore that for now. Um, so what we have here is um, in, when, when you write a pure Ansible module, uh, you have, would have like an argument spec here that defines the parameters. What we have added is we say it's a form spec because it defines both. It defines the arguments in terms of what Ansible expects as arguments to the module, but it's also at the same time 
the arguments that we send to the API when we perform something. Um, so in this case, we define an argument that is called name. And it's marked as required true because um, this is like the one uh, part of the entity that is like required if you create one. Um, but uh, the nice thing here is it, it knows from, from, from this definition, it knows that um, on, on the foreman side, there is a name um, entry in the whole object of, of an organization, and it can compare it for you. So if you create one, uh, if you call the module with a name, it can search the API based on this definition and the name you provided and create update as, as required. Um, and then we have this small block, which we can extend later on if you need to. Uh, API connection is just, just a con um, context wrapper that we have uh, that ensures that you have an API connection and module run will then go and perform the actual search, create, update, delete, depending on what the user has entered in, in their playbook. And obviously, you got to call the main method at some point. So there is this if name equals main, call main thing that you have in, I guess, all Python programs, I think. Um, right. So the reality is slightly more complicated. I'll show you in a moment uh, because we also need to add documentation that I uh, mentioned before. And some modules will have a bit more complicated um, run definition because you not always have a one-to-one -one mapping between Ansible parameters and formant parameters. So you need to do a bit of translation. So just, just to show you the reality, I think the one I showed you earlier was like 10 lines, right? Um, this whole module is 116 lines. But um, as you see, there's, first of all, licensing uh, boilerplate at the, at the top. Then you get of the documentation stanza, which is um, pretty much uh, like um, needed for every module. You have like description, uh, you have authors. Um, and then this is the interesting part. These are the options that are defined and visible if you call um, Ansible doc. Um, and you see the uh, organization module has more than just um, just the name, it has also description, label, and it has an ignore types um, option uh, parameter. And then below here, you have the invocation of the documentation fragments uh, because we need the default form and one, but also the entity state one, which because it's not part of um, of uh, the foreman main fragment and nested parameters because organizations can have parameters. There is an example, it's pretty short and probably should be extended. This is not a hint to, to contribute, it is. Um, and then we import from uh, from our uh, module utils that I mentioned earlier, the, for, the helper uh, of the entity module, but also the nested parameters mix in which uh, implements parameters, which is nice. You just add this mix in and you don't have to care at all about it anymore. Um, but I think organizations and locations are the only ones who use it. I don't know. But, um, here is again, the the definition of the whole formant spec I've shown name earlier in the slide. You have also description and label, which is like super simple, which you define a parameter which has like no options whatsoever because it's just a string. Um, then there is the ignore types thing, which I mentioned uh, in the documentation part. It's set to be a list. It's not required. And here comes the funny part. Um, when you create uh, 
an organization and also a location, it gets automatically assigned a lot of um, templates and everything. And if you do not want this, you can pass this ignore types uh, thing so that it doesn't get um, this automatic like assignment. But for some reason, um, the API, when you create or update it, the parameter is called ignore types. But if you uh, pull an uh, organization using the API and show like all the parameters it has, the parameter is called select all types. I have no idea why, but um, it is. And because of that, we need to do a bit of translation logic in, in the module. So we got to pull the entity manually first. And if the select all types is in the existing, like if it exists and, this, and select all types is set, we just pretend that it wasn't and the ignore types was, was set. Now the entity looks exactly like Ansible was expected to, and we can call module run to then compare the entity that was in the API to the one that is created from the description the user passed as parameters. And if they match, we have not to do anything. And if they don't, we will issue an upgrade uh, update call to the API. Uh, and whoever designs this API, you owe me a drink. Switching back to slides and looking at our next example, um, uh, Foreman architecture module. Uh, Foreman has architectures, right? And it's mostly used to, uh, to pick up the right boot medium and everything. But they have a very interesting um, part that they refer to operating systems. Like there's a, a foreign key, right? And because of that, when you create an architecture in Foreman, you also got to uh, call out operating systems. You want um, you want to be assigned to this architecture. And the API expects IDs because that's how APIs work, right? Uh, they want numbers. Users, and especially those who uh, want to have like a defined state somewhere in their Git repository or something, they don't really like numbers, so they want to list names. And um, we have a helper here again that if you say operating systems, and you set the type to entity list, which is something that is not standard to, to Ansible. It's something that we invented. So internally to Ansible, it's still a list. But uh, for former modules, we know this. it's a list of entities. So we can look them up using the normal uh, search API. And then when talking to the API to create an architecture, it will actually contain numbers instead of names. Again, it's completely transparent. To, to the user and uh, makes their life easier. Uh, but when you're creating modules, this is something that you will get quite often because um, I think almost every every like um, API endpoint has a way to refer to something some other object. And another thing that you see in the same slide is um, besides this form spec, we have also the argument spec. This is the Ansible native way to define um, parameters is um, this module supports uh, renaming. So, which is a bit weird because it makes the whole thing not idempotent anymore, but people still want to rename things at some points. Um, but here we say we have an additional parameter, it's called updated name. But it's only visible on the Ansible side. It's not visible to Foreman. And what the module will do if you pass both name and updated name is it will look up the object by its current name. And then it will issue an update st uh, statement to set the name parameter to the one you provided in the updated name parameter. While this is supported, 
I would not recommend it because um, uh, it makes playbooks not not behave the same on second invocation as it's pretty weird. Um, and then I mentioned earlier the Catello product module. It's a bit bigger, but it still uh, has the same logic, right? It's it's still you define a name. Uh, like a, a module name, so you can deduct the right API endpoint. And then you have a slightly longer um, spec because the product now goes and refers to a lot of other entities. We have GPG key and the whole SSL setup here um, that is referring to uh, content types, uh, content credentials, I'm sorry. And I got to scroll here a bit. Um, usually, we, if we say it's of a type entity or type entity list, we would go and deduct the name of the um, resource in the API from the parameter name. But because of the fact that both GPG and SSL keys in Catello are content credentials, we got a hint uh, the modules by saying ah, the resource type is actually content credentials. Um, and another thing that um, the modules will not do for you, or at least not always, is um, when you have content credentials and want to look them up by name, you have to pass organization uh, because different organizations can have the same name of a GPG key, but will will have like a different ID in the database and also different contents. So we define that the scope is scope by organization. And another last thing that you will see in, in a few modules is um, the parameter is called GPG key. And because it's called key something, Ansible uh, will yell at us if you do not set no log true or false explicitly, because it uh, thinks that everything that is a key uh, might be leaking credentials, which is true in many cases. So we got to set um, no log false here explicitly because while those are keys, they are public keys and it's fine to leak them into logs and everything. And that's it. This is all a Catello product module needs to do to create a product in Catello, which then also creates them in, in candle pin and pulp and makes everybody set spin a bit. Um, now I have like four to five more slides about the development environment, but we are also five minutes until the end of this session. So I guess uh, it's another time to go ask questions or ask if there are any questions. And if not, I'll just run through this. And if I run over, it will still be on YouTube with the whole thing. And you can ask questions afterwards, of course. So I'll be here for another, I don't know, half an hour. How, how long you need me? Lucas. Um, I started to look into implementing the SALT plugin into the, the repo. And I figured out that the the API endpoints start with a prefix salt instead of slash API directly. And I couldn't figure out uh, how I need to implement that. that it you don't have to. API endpoints. OK. You don't have to. It, it will pu pull down the API doc. And the API doc contains resource names and URLs. And as long as you pick the right resource name, it will find the right URL for you. OK, great. Thank you. All the magic for you. Ron. Yeah, one question. Uh, can it be used from a remote host, or does the family need to be installed on the same host with format? It can and should be used from a remote host. I mean, you can also use it locally, of course, but um, it doesn't matter where you run it from as long as you can establish an HTTP connection to uh, the API, you're good. Awesome. Cool. It also supports proxies if you're in a weird environment where you need to set proxies. Very cool.
Okay, I guess that's the two questions we had so far. Then the quick run through through the environment. Um, I guess a bit uh, related to what Ron asked earlier. Um, if you just want to execute this, uh, you can install it from either RPM or Debian packages. Um, from our repositories, you can pull it from Galaxy and you can pull it also from um, Automation Hub if you're a satellite customer, if you're Ansible customer, sorry. Oh, that's like uh, paywall, right? Um, and the only dependency, this is like external to, to us today is requests, which you usually have like on every system because it's like the HTTP library for Python. And the moment you have that on your on your machine, you can go and talk uh, to any um, foreman installation out there. It's also like version agnostic. So given that it pulls down the API doc dynamically, you can point it the one moment to a devil machine and the other to a 3.4 and it still will work. Um, obviously, they should know about the same parameters and everything. Um, but um, other than that, it should just work. And uh, if you're using a parameter that is like unknown to the specific installation, it will issue a warning saying, hey, um, I could execute this uh, request, but um, this specific parameter, your server doesn't know shit about. So happens. But the moment you want to uh, switch over and actually change code and try things out, things get a bit more complicated. Obviously, if you're just going to submit a PR for uh, a documentation or some other like smaller change, you don't need a full-blown developer environment because um, like it's it's static anyways. For Python code, it's different and. Um, this is partially because we have more dependencies um, and uh, also need like the whole um, VCR setup there. So first step, usually what I do is you create a virtual environment and we have in the make file, we have a target that's called test setup, which will do all the setup for you. And if you ever want to do it like manually without invoking the make file, it's essentially doing, uh, it's installing uh, requirements dev, uh, so it contains a VCR and uh, all the dependencies, and it creates a small um, configuration file that is supposed to, to point at a foreman installation if you ever need to issue live calls. For live calls, you will also require a Catello environment you can also use satellite. We don't really care as long as like, the version is like recent. Um, so if you call just make test or make test name of the module, everything runs against recorded fixtures, and this is cool. The moment you want to record, you need a live setup. Um, we don't really care where you get this live uh, live setup from. Um, it can be forklift, which because that's like the easiest way I think to get a small and um, broad-like environment in a VM. But if you have a lab somewhere in your uh, company, you can use that. Uh, the only like thing is, it will issue potentially destructive calls to the API. So don't do this against your prod system. And if you do, don't blame me. I don't care. Um, and you got to enter the credentials to that in this file. Server YAML, it's just to have like form and URL and username and password. And that's it. The moment you have those, um, you're good to re record the fixtures, also record completely fresh fixtures if you add it in your module. And I could talk like even more and more, but luckily for you, I don't have any slides left. So thank you for listening. And I managed less than an hour. Marek didn't. Um, I'm here if you want to have uh, questions. Ron, was it a clap or a hands up? I didn't see it correctly. Yeah, definitely a clap. OK. Thank you. Then you're welcome. Thank you very much, Evgeny. There was a lot of 
clapping and even some thumbs up, which I believe means that uh, the session was great, uh, which I can uh, confirm. Um, since Evgeny mentioned that he still has some time, so if there are any questions at this point, uh, feel free to ask. Uh, but as, as he mentioned, like we can also follow up afterwards. Uh, so anything, or maybe also if you have any feedback on this session, is, is there something that you, you didn't get from, from this session and uh, you would like to uh, get in more details later? Maybe I would have one question for those who would like to really start contributing, um, either with small things like you mentioned, the documentation or elsewhere. Do you have any list of easy tasks or easy fixes uh, that people can start with? Um, no. I mean, I have. Uh, what? I have the full issue list, but it's not like it's 120 issues. And I guess most of them are not specifically uh, easy, um, but also they could use a bit of um, triage. So if you just want to go through them and uh, answer user questions, this would also be a great contribution. Um, but yeah, I don't have a necessarily uh, like a beginner's list of contributions that we, uh, I think we have in Formal Core, we have like this uh, bite sized bugs or something. Um, we, we don't triage it to that like granularity today. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Maybe something for the future, like if you see something uh, in this list, I guess, uh, maybe we could add some simple label or label with something saying this. this could yeah. be I think the label exists because G GitHub creates them automatically, like easy something, but um, yeah. OK, perfect. So last chance for any questions before we wrap this up. OK, sounds like we don't have any questions today. So thank you very, uh, thank you very much, uh, Evgeny, for a great presentation. Um, I found it very useful. Uh, I'm I'm going to record uh, stop the recording here. I will push it to our YouTube channel uh, when possible. Um, and yeah, I hope to see a lot of new contributions in this repo. So do I. <laughs>